read a lot, mm -hmm. don't watch TV, mm -hmm. make business your number one priority and focus, find good mentors, network all the time, never give up. What is going on you guys? Welcome to World Class Dropouts. We are so excited to have Matt Morgan here today. Matt, appreciate you joining us. Of course. Brother. Thank Anytime. you for spending your time with us. So first and foremost, man, really what our show's about, we just kind of want to connect people with real people who have done it, who have made it. So start sure. a little bit about where you're from. We talked about it a little bit. Tell people where you're from, how you got to this position. Uh, so originally I was born and raised in Missoula, Montana. Uh, my grandparents had 5,000 acres out there, so I spent uh, quite a bit of time on their farm. Um, figured out in early in high school that I was a lot different than other kids. Couldn't figure out why. Uh, started my first company when I was 16. Um, got fired from a lot of jobs along the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, just kind of became a serial entrepreneur throughout the years. I uh, got involved full time in cannabis in 2008. Um, still involved today, 10 years later. Uh, been a ton of ups and downs. Um, and it's, it's been quite the ride. So, uh, yeah, here we are in LA now, yeah. <laughs> uh, a long way from home. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's been quite the journey. Yeah. So. so talking to a lot of different people, it's it's funny because all these people have got this profound success, and the underlying commonality between all these people is that people felt different. What was that like, like growing up and and being different from everybody? Because it's a positive thing, but like I've talked to about with a lot of people, it's like portrayed as this negative and you're treated like shit and you go through all this right. hardships for what but you know what I'm saying like what, what is that like so I mean it was it's cool now yeah to look right. back and think about right. it but back then uh, no it wasn't cool all yeah, right it didn't you. feel cool at the time uh, you feel kind of like you're an outsider um, you feel neglected to a certain extent mm -hmm. and you feel like uh, you're kind of a you know a fuck up to a certain extent right because mm -hmm. you can't hold a job um, you're not one of the cool kids in school necessarily um, your family wonders what's wrong with you and mm -hmm. why you can't be a contributing member to, to normal society mm -hmm. so um, when you're young and I would say naive to a certain extent uh, you do f you do feel it's it's it doesn't feel good right you know it feels um, it does feel like you're kind of on your own island yeah how do you um, combat that feeling at the time I didn't know what to do I was right. just struggling to keep my head above water and yeah, try and figure you. out figure it out right um, Nowadays, I combat the feeling by, you know, going out and executing mm -hmm. on things. Mm -hmm. So that really calms my anxiety or anything else down is, is just going out and doing it. And right. So you had, you had this entrepreneurial spirit, obviously. I'm a big believer. That's kind of something you're born with, like you're talking about. Agreed. You kind of were rolling with that at 16. Then you get out. How do you transition from a place like Montana to moving towards a place like L.A.? Where did that step become? So there was some break points in between. Um, I got involved in real estate in my early 20s in okay. Montana, so that was that was kind of my door opener to show me how the world kind of works, mm -hmm. dealing with big numbers, yeah. you know, uh, large investments by people, understanding psych psychology, human emotion, stuff like that. So I did that, got involved in cannabis in Montana, but realized that I hit a ceiling very quickly, so I had to look for a larger pond, if you will. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, ended up settling on Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, they had a very favorable cannabis program, so yeah. I moved there. <laughs> Uh, first, and that kind of gave me my set of training wheels for for the for the big show. Uh, so I went from Scotts from Missoula to Scottsdale, Arizona to Las Vegas, Nevada, and then to LA. So I, I had a, a progression of steps that brought me to uh, crazy La La Land. Mm -hmm. So obviously, <laughs> networking has been a big part of your career. You're associated with some of the biggest names in branding, um, and one of those is obviously Dan Bilzerian. Talk to us kind of about how your guys' relationship came about, because obviously there's a lot of things that progress from that. How do you network with these kind of people? What, where does those relationships begin? You know, I think, first of all, I'm a very social individual, so networking uh, comes very naturally to me. Right. Um, and I've just always networked and try to find, you know, have as many quality people in my network as possible. Mm -hmm. I think that stems from your upbringing um, and your core values. And I think Montana played a big factor in that. Yeah. 
you know, you come across much more genuine in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, you do what you say you're going to do. Right. <laughs> you don't bullshit people. Yeah, that's real. That's and right. so, um, as far as Dan goes, uh, I was living in Vegas. You know, I had the largest dispensary, one of the largest cannabis companies in the country. He was Dan, being Dan in, mm -hmm. in Vegas, and you know, we just <laughs> crossed paths, and we were two kind of young playboys out there, so we, we hit it off right away. That's awesome, bro. So, obviously, the value in relationships, let's just touch on, for all the entrepreneurs watching, obviously, that's kind of the industry we're in, where are they going to find value networking? If you had to give them one thing to say, hey, you know, you touched on it a lot, the authenticity, I think that's fucking huge. What would you say the one thing is going to be for most of these people separating themselves, whether they're reaching out over a social brand on Instagram? How can people separate themselves to get in touch with the right people? You know, I think sometimes it can be very challenging on like a, a social media platform just because the people you want to get in touch with are getting inundated with so many requests, right? right. So, I mean, even for myself, it's, it's overwhelming to try and reach out to all these people that, you know, want a mentorship or want help or whatever right. that may be. And so I think what's been much more effective for me is <clears throat> meeting people, seeing what their network looks like, meeting their friends, mm -hmm. becoming friends with those friends, seeing that circle, seeing what friends they have, mm -hmm. and just really hand selecting who you choose to spend your time with because right. you, you know, your future is really dictated by the things that you read and the information you absorb and then you know, the top five people that you spend your time with. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you just have to find those top quality type of people. I've had much more success face to face in person than I have uh, online or in social media. Um, it takes a lot more balls to network in person yeah. than it does on social media. True. So uh, a lot of people really have to step out of their comfort zone, which is also a huge plus in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you know I think that people should be more into the the person to person connection, um, and I think that will get you a lot farther in life mm -hmm. versus sending a DM and hoping for a response. Right. I mean, you know, if you're reaching out to someone that has a couple million followers, imagine how many messages they get a day. Right. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, it can variable. be um, it can be challenging, but just just decide what you want as far as goals and then work backwards from there, right? Mm -hmm. So and then you can create milestones from, if it's a big goal, and you create milestones that help you get to that, that ultimate goal. Right. Um, and then you surround yourself with people that can help you get to that goal and yeah. that you enjoy spending time yeah, with. Yeah, your connections are definitely And the other right. important thing is find quality, good human beings. Don't surround yourself with shitheads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> true, that's, that is valuable. For sure. So 2018, moving into 2019, business is booming. First, I want to touch before we talk on actually the business side of things, your personal brand, bro. It's blowing up. It's awesome. If you guys don't already have them on Instagram, go find them on Instagram. Talk to us a little bit about the power of a personal brand and, and kind of how you grew that platform. So it's funny. Um, you know, I, I got involved in cannabis early on, but I really didn't want to make it public uh, just because society viewed it in kind of a negative connotation. Right. And so I had a... I think when I started Instagram, I had like 300 followers or something. Mm -hmm. uh, just my close circle of friends and family. Right. And eventually, as my cannabis endeavors got larger and larger, people were like, why aren't you posting about this shit on, on social media? It's super right. cool. Like, mm -hmm. you know, walking through these NASA looking factories that we build and whatnot. And so finally, I was like, all right, you're right. Like, it's time to start like showing the world what we've done. Mm -hmm. And that's really when my social media and my, my personal brand took off. Yeah, when you're um, pushing that, you know, because world-class dropouts, it's something that comes with social stigmas too, you know, right. the word dropout. When you're pushing something that maybe doesn't have the best social stigma, how do you push that in a positive light? You know, I used a lot of humor, mm -hmm. and then I used a lot of stories because the government's propaganda for the last 60 years has completely destroyed uh, right. cannabis in the yeah. public eye. And so I was really fighting an uphill battle because mm -hmm. they've spent how much money on commercials and billboards and everything else. Right. Um, so I made it, it was a mixture of humor as well as mixing in like stories of, you know, helping people and that this really is, you know, a natural miracle drug. It's, you know, it works. Like right. I've watched it work on thousands of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just used whatever means I could to get the word out there that, hey, this is, you know, this is something real. It's not just for stoners and, and hippies. and Right. And, you know, tie dye. There's nothing wrong with tie dye, but mm -hmm. it's there's a lot more to this plant than, yeah. than that. And um, yeah, it's it's hard because you know, even today, like you can get kicked off social media for talking about cannabis. Right. Um, Google, like none of the traditional platforms really allow you to advertise for that stuff. So it has been challenging for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I mean, we've come so far in the last ten years, right? Right. From you know, my family not hot talking to me because I thought I was becoming a drug dealer to, <laughs> you know, me being on the cover of magazines. So yeah. it's, it's, it's been crazy. That's awesome, bro. That's a huge job. Yeah. 
So kind of from rewinding a little bit, obviously the business gets started, you get into the industry. I'm really not sure what took place right in the beginning with business, but in this kind of industry, how do you scale? You know, it's obviously a lot of these entrepreneurs watching, they've got their businesses, they've got their right. brands. How do you scale that shit? So the way I've done it historically, that's worked very well for me is I haven't hired a lot of people within the space. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually looked uh, at hiring from other industries. Um, I've hired people from Walt Disney, from Coca-Cola, from Microsoft, um, from a ton of different, you know, different verticals. Right. And they've brought their expertise over to the space and I can train them about cannabis. So mm -hmm. that's been very helpful. Um, I instill a very strong culture within my companies. Yeah. And if you know you don't fit that culture, you don't, really don't get hired. Mm -hmm. And I ask a lot of, all right, I train my HR team to ask a lot of qualifying questions to the people to see if they'll fit the culture or not. Because if you can't fit the culture, you, you won't make it more than two weeks. Yeah, right, it's brilliant. And so if you have the right culture and you have the right leadership from the top down, that's really how you scale is build the quality executive team and you can scale from there. Um, my last company, Reef, or one of my last companies, I had 435 employees in oh, management. Damn, that's huge, bro. Yeah. So talk a little bit more about that. I want to dig into that because it's funny. A lot of people we talk to from different athletic programs all the way to the biggest businesses like yours, everybody touches on culture, and it's something that's kind of hard to teach, you know? Getting, right. And I know a lot of people are saying, oh, the hardest thing you can do in a company is try to replace yourself. Well, culture is teaching other people to act the way you act, right? right. And so it, it's how do you teach that? How do you get people to understand that shit? Well, it's funny. So, actually, one of my new companies that I'm launching is called Culture. There you go. <laughs> uh, with a K, so I could trademark it. But um, with that being said, the way I did it, or I've done it, is I'll sit down with a few key people that I know are going to be top level executives in my company. And then we'll go through an exercise. And I'll, if I'm at the top, mm -hmm. then I, I'll let everyone know at the table what's the three or four or five most important things to me when, when it comes to hiring individuals. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about core values, you're not talking about skill sets, right? So it's, you know, um, honesty, integrity, do whatever it takes, stuff like that, mm -hmm. hardworking. Um, and so I laid it out on the table and then everyone else said, all right, that, and I'd like to add this. And then I'd say yay or nay. And we'd come up with what the four or five most important core values were mm -hmm. to that core group of small people that were going to end up running that company. And we hired based upon those core values. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Yeah, really yeah. instilling that in the beginning. Yes. Yeah, that's so smart. I can teach anyone anything, but you can't teach anyone their core values. That's something that they were born and that they're raised with. Right. Wow, man, that's powerful. Okay, so now kind of rewinding a little bit, um, you're talking about kind of the company and and what takes place within the company. How do you develop a company when it's it's taking it from an idea from you know you got these great ideas and a lot of these young entrepreneurs we talk about like. God, they all got these ideas, but nobody's actually going out and doing it. What would you say to a young entrepreneur, the first steps in taking an idea and transition it into maybe a company or the beginning steps of a small business? You right. Know? So I think that going from a vision to an actual execution style of, the, of that vision mm -hmm. is probably one of the most challenging parts of being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, because that's really where sitting in a room and coming up with a cool idea is one thing but actually hitting the pavement and making that a reality is another. Right. And most people have to go out of their comfort zone in order to make that vision into a reality. Mm -hmm. You have to pick up your phone, you have to call people, you have to do things that you're not right. used to doing. You, you have to, you know, a lot of times go out on a limb and act like you know what you're talking about. Maybe you don't even know what you're talking mm -hmm. about, right? Right. So that can be very uncomfortable for people. People don't like to talk about things they don't know about. Mm -hmm. um, and so really it's about Obviously networking, find the right mentors. Um, they can always, especially if they're a lot older, they can always help point in the right direction. You know, call this guy, try this, do that. Um, that helped me a lot in the early on. Uh, but the biggest thing for me was when I started my real estate career, um, it was really a make or break point for me where I really had to make it work. And so I did a lot of knocking on people's doors, cold knocking, cold mm -hmm. calling. Yeah. And so it made me develop really leather skin. And I literally you know have no fear so i'll call anyone i'll show up anywhere i'll go to any meeting like i don't care right and that's the stuff that makes you successful mm -hmm. like really it's the uncomfortable stuff that you have to go do that really ends up making you successful mm -hmm. and i think where the gap is, is is most people are not willing to take that next step and pick up the phone and call someone random or go knock on their door you know right. what i mean yeah because it's not fun like it's not being not, said no, no it's not <laughs> fun, especially getting endorsed on your times. face is not a good time yeah but it's just part of you know growing and that's what separates people right for sure yeah because most people might talk about it a hundred times but won't do it mm -hmm. and so it's the guys literally don't talk about it and just go do it yeah so we were talking to Drama the other day and he was telling us about, we brought up the fact that this is kind of one of the things we ask people is that our name is obviously world-class dropouts. 
and we were talking about kind of the social stigma behind the word. What's your opinion of just first and foremost the word dropout? Like, what does that mean to you? <laughs> well, I'm a college dropout. Yeah, uh, I went to college for ten days. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? All ten days were dope. Well. I was sitting in these classes, and obviously I was getting a major in, uh, in business, mm -hmm. emphasizing in finance, because um, numbers are very important in business. Right. If you don't understand your numbers, you're, you're, you're done. Um, but I was listening to what these professors were saying, and I'm just like, this isn't adding up. You know, I don't know everything. I don't know much of anything, actually. I'm 18 years old, but this isn't making sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so I started digging into you know, who these people were, what they were doing. I'm like, these guys are just entrepreneurs that couldn't make it as entrepreneurs. Now they're teaching all these kids how to be entrepreneurs. So right. I'm like, I'm out of here. From not making it. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not listening to people. That, that'd be like listening to a trainer that's overweight. But what, like, I'm not gonna take one piece of advice from yeah, you, right? Exactly. Like, come You're on, not even doing like, get out of here. Yeah. And so like, I'm not gonna listen to someone that's never been successful in business. Like, mm -hmm. why, why, would I, why would I take a page of someone's playbook when their playbook sucks? Right. So after 10 days, I'm like, I'm out of here. And I never came back. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, dope. yeah, I'm a dropout. Okay. Um, I think dropout can mean a ton of different things, right? But it's used in a negative connotation in our society because they use it as a thing to instill fear into young people to make them go to school, to college, right. and to fit into their box. Right. I just didn't fit in that box. Yeah, 100%. So kind of when you, you leave school, and obviously it's, it's funny because people got this huge misconception like you're running some of the biggest companies in the world. What do you do for self-education? You know, it, it, that's part of the process. For sure. Right. So if you're not going to go to school, you have to learn somewhere, right. right? And I just decided that I was going to learn through real world experience, mm -hmm. um, through super quality mentors, mm -hmm. um, and a ton of reading. Mm -hmm. So I used to read about a book a week okay. while I was, you know, trying to build these companies. What's your favorite book? Uh, Think and Grow Rich, probably, Grow Rich. or How to Win Friends okay. and Influence People. Oh, yeah, they're both, yeah, they're both solid. I like older books that will hold their relevancy forever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right now, I'm reading uh, Finish Big, which helps you prepare for big exits out of companies. Which is brilliant. Talk about that because I know Tony Robbins touches on that. If you don't got an exit strategy, you don't got a company. Yeah, I mean, I think you should have your exit strategy laid out when you start the company. Mm -hmm. At least you should have some sort of high-level thoughts in mind about how you would want to exit, right? Right. Whether you're going to go public, whether you're going to get acquired. like What is your exit strategy? Are you just going to build this thing for the next thousand years? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, yeah. So, yeah, um, it's funny. One of the first... like books of importance that I read was uh, Tony Robbins' Awaken the Giant Within mm -hmm. when I was like 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And that uh, kind of restarted rewiring my brain. Yeah, yeah, which is powerful. So I'm a, I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan. Yeah. Very smart man. Um, but I think that uh, it's huge to make sure that you have an exit strategy in mind when you're building a company because you really don't know. You know what I mean? Like that company might not be being worth $10 or it might end up being worth $10 billion. Right. You have no idea. So to... I don't think enough entrepreneurs prepare themselves for the exit strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're so focused on trying to get the company stood up that they don't ever think about the you know the end game. Mm -hmm. And I've I've been a victim to this as well. Of, of you know early on I was young, I was aggressive, I was excited. Um, I just kept climbing fat very quickly because mm -hmm. the space was escalating so quickly. And so I really wasn't thinking about the end result for my, you know, some of my ventures when I should have been. And that's, you know, why I'm educating myself on, right. on exits now. Mm -hmm. um, in my old age, that's something I have to think about. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So, um, yeah, man, like I said, to all the young entrepreneurs out there that are thinking about starting a new company, definitely have the exit strategy in mind as well. Mm -hmm. Who's, who's going to buy you? You know, what's make some milestones. What do you want this thing to be worth in 24 months, 36 months, 48 months? Right. And how are you going to get there? Yeah. Okay, so kind of in closing and, and really wrapping up, kind of the majority is, is the nice thing about the way we progress through this interview is it's, it's really showing people that it's doable. You know, it's you're coming out of a situation in Montana. I'm an average farm kid out of Montana. Right. So, like, the way I say is, like, you know, I'm not, I don't have some special recipe in the back room. Right. It's just like... I worked my ass off. Mm -hmm. I networked like crazy. I was willing to go out of my comfort zone multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. I found the right mentors that had my interest in mind, and you know it all worked out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm 33. I've been busting my butt as an entrepreneur since I was 20 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's been a it's been an interesting 13 year grind for yeah, sure. Yeah, because I mean, our, our friend Casey just put out something that was just I think really sums up business, and it's. 2% of people are employing the 98% of people that quit. Right. 2% is just the people that kept going. And the next no might have been 
the final the final phase before you're okay. yes, right? Right. And most people, you have to be persistent. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the most important things is like, no matter how many people tell you you're crazy or tell you that it's impossible or tell you that they can't do it, it's just, it, they might be just two days away from being successful, mm -hmm. you know? And so many people, they try something, but they don't like things that are challenging or hard. So after right. two, at first it sounds like a great idea, like, yeah, I'm gonna kill it, I'm gonna crush this. And like two weeks later, you talk to them like, oh man, this isn't for me, this, mm -hmm. this isn't my thing. So, you know, I'm probably just gonna throw in the towel. I'm like, well, you know, that's where you're gonna be an employee for the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs don't ever throw in the towel. Right. They pivot, they figure it out. You know, they drop the ball, they pick up the ball and start running again. Like, mm -hmm. that's, and that's something that I feel also that you're genetically ingrained with. Mm -hmm. So to close it out, for our people watching, if you had one piece of advice that you could hand to a, a young kid, because obviously it's hard to connect with everybody. Right. If you could hand this one piece of advice to everybody, what would that piece of advice be? As far as being a successful yeah, entrepreneur? Yeah, just being an entrepreneur, being somebody on their grind. Maybe, maybe they haven't figured it out yet. Read a lot. Mm -hmm. Don't watch TV. Mm -hmm. Make business your number one priority and focus. Find good mentors. Network all the time. Never give up. Yeah. Well, there so there's, like, seven. there's like seven yeah. for you. <laughs> so if you needed advice, but they're all they're important. all equally important. Yeah. Like those are all very aggressive contributing factors to my success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I can't leave any of them behind. Awesome. Well, Matt, appreciate you, brother. Yeah, Thank you so by. much. It was awesome. Appreciate it. Pleasure meeting you. From us to you guys, we appreciate you guys tuning in, and we'll see you next time on World Class Dropouts. Peace.